Welcome and thanks for attending the Sciences Graduate Student Open House. I'm Justin Fuhr. Uh, I'm a science liaison librarian at the Sciences and Technology Libraries and I'll be hosting today. And so I just wanted to start um, the open house here one second here. Just trying to change the slide here one second. Okay. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on there, but uh, I just want to begin with the traditional territories acknowledgement. So the University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. And we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So we've arranged for six presenters from across campus to speak to you today about how they can support you in your graduate studies. And so this is the first year for our online open house. We've done it this uh, number of years um, in the past in person. So please bear with us for any technical difficulties that come up. Um, we'll have lightning talk style presentations, uh, about seven minutes each, and then there'll be time for questions after. Uh, you can either enter your questions into the Q&A section um, of the, of the GoToWebinar platform, or you can just type it in the chat, and then during the Q&A portion, uh, we'll address those questions. We'll keep things moving as quickly as possible, but if you have any additional questions for presenters, um, their contact information will be provided on the Sciences Graduate Open House website. I'll have a link for that um, following the following the event here. So I'm not sure why the PowerPoint's not changing slides, but here's the um, here's the schedule for today. So um, Sarah Seeley will be talking to you first. She is the Graduate Student Awards Officer, and then Louis Gervais will be after. She's the Academic Integrity Coordinator. We have David Ness, Director of the Student Counseling Center. We have Meg Miller. She's the Visualize, Data and Visualization, or GIS and Digitalization, Visualization Librarian at uh, the, the libraries here. And we have Dr. Darren Fast, Director of Partnerships and Innovation on campus. And then finally, we have Marie Spear, who's a Science Librarian at the Sciences and Technology Libraries. Um, I'm not sure why these slides aren't changing. Anyways, okay. So first up, we have Sarah Seeley. Sarah Seeley is the awards officer for the Faculty of Graduate Studies and has worked at the University of Manitoba as an administrator since 2005. She has spent the last 13 years of her career working with graduate students and graduate program administration. In 2014, she joined the Faculty of Graduate Studies as an awards assistant on the awards team and then moved into the role of awards officer and team lead for awards in graduate studies in January 2019. So basically, she helps you get money for your research, for your graduate studies, and I will pass it off to Sarah. I'll just make her a uh, presenter here. One second. Okay. Well, thank you, Justin. Uh, hopefully, everyone can hear me, and if not, um, you know, please... Um, feel free to let me know in the chat if I'm not doing okay. <laughs> um, as, as Justin said, I'm Sarah Seeley. I'm the Graduate Awards Officer. I have a very brief presentation here for you. I'm going to get my screen shared right now, um, and I'll get to it, and then I'll, take, uh, I'll have a little period for questions at the end. Uh, I'm just going to give you a very, very brief overview of Graduate Awards. Um, and funding that is available for graduate students. Um, so I thought I would include here, um, and if anybody does want any slides after the session, I could always make arrangements to send them to Justin to be sent out um, through the libraries if anyone wants any. Um, I just thought I'd note, um, so I'm the awards officer, and on my team in graduate studies, we have four awards assistants, my colleague listed there, Charlie, Madison, Ellen, and Kayla. Uh, we also have a general awards email, and if you're not sure who to email, that is your best bet. It's super easy to remember because it's graduate.awards at umanitoba.ca. Um, so if you send an email there and you're not sure who to contact, 
one of the, our team members who will be monitoring that account will either respond or they'll, they'll forward it on to someone who can assist with your inquiry. So quickly going over just what are some of the, the types of student awards and funding that are available. Um, so there are scholarships and prizes, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. These are always based on academic achievement. Some scholarships can come from our Office in Graduate Studies. Some can come from the Office of Financial Aid and Awards, which is actually a separate office from us, or from a student's home department. There's also stipends and department-based funding. Usually these are available from a student's advisor, supervisor, or from the home department. Usually those are not based necessarily on academic, academic achievement, meaning there's no specific GPA requirement. This may just be a funding agreement between a student and an advisor um, for the advisor taking on the student and as well um, for work in the lab and all those kinds of things furthering their program and their studies. The sources of funding can mean it's paid to you in different ways. Not all scholarships are paid the same way. Some scholarships we pay via the University of Manitoba's payroll system and we set it up so you get a direct deposit every two weeks, like a, like a bi-weekly paycheck. And some awards are deposited to students' tuition fees on Aurora Student, where students get a credit towards their tuition. Um, probably some of the biggest questions that we get in awards are, how can I find the awards that I'm eligible for? Um, searching for funding is, is not necessarily a straightforward process, because even within certain departments in the university, there can be um, research that's funded by all different kinds of um, either government agencies. A good example I like to use is research in psychology. Depending on the sub area of your research, you could be eligible for awards through either health research or through NSERC, the National Science and Engineering uh, Council, or through SHRC, the Social Sciences and Humanities Council. Um, so it really depends on you knowing your own research and then searching for funding based on your own knowledge of your specific sub area. The biggest one, if I could tell you to read one email that you get in your inbox from uh, the university each week, we send out an email every Wednesday. It goes to all students who are registered in graduate studies. And in that email, it's called, uh, it's called Faculty of Graduate Studies Upcoming Awards and Deadlines email. Every week, we do what we call, we advertise award competitions to students. The awards will be listed in that email until the deadline passes. So even if you missed one week and you see it the next week, it'll always have information with the deadline. Each email contains lists of awards and then a link to where you can go to find information on how to apply, what is the deadline, what are the supporting documents, all those kind of good things. So that's the one email I always say to students. If you read one email that you get from the university, read that one, because that one's going to tell you, you know, how can I get additional awards and scholarships to fund my graduate program, right? Um, we also have an awards database, uh, a Faculty of Graduate Studies awards database. Um, I put a note here, we have a new database, actually, uh, at the IST uh, department is working on a brand new database for us that is going to be quite a bit more advanced than what we have now. So we're really looking forward to this. It's probably launching in early 2021. Um, right now, our database is a static link. You can search for awards by name or subject. Financial Aid and Awards also has their own database of searchable awards as well. Um, additionally, students' home departments have departmental awards that are just for students who are studying in that specific department. I'm just going to use an example biological sciences, they have certain awards in their area that can only go to students who are studying in biological sciences in master's or PhD programs. So the departments in those case would set the deadlines and the application procedure for those. So if you're a graduate student, you might want to, and, and you're not sure how they communicate those awards competitions, you may want to just inquire with the support staff person, the administrative person in your department, and they'll probably let you know um, how much, uh, you know, how they communicate those, whether they do an email or, or if they, and if they all advertise them all at one time, et cetera. So they can let you know. I will just mention that bursaries are different from awards. 
uh, and like scholarships and prizes because bursaries are based on financial need, whereas scholarships are based on academic achievement. So all bursaries are actually handled by the Financial Aid and Awards Office. So all graduate and undergraduate bursaries, okay? As well, there are some specific requirements for bursaries for international students, and they have a dedicated website that's quite excellent about how to apply for bursaries, and I have listed it there. You can even simply search bursaries on the UManitoba homepage, and you'll find it quite easily. So. Um, one of the biggest other questions I get, and I'm going to go over this briefly because I feel like I'm, I am getting to the end, but it's supposed to be a short and sweet. Students always ask me, um, you know, what are, what are the amounts of these awards that I can win? I can sort of show me the money. Um, so I thought I would just talk about a little bit about the major scholarships that are available for graduate students and, and the values um, and who's eligible. So, there's lots of external awards offered through the Tri-Agencies of Canada. So those are the three federal funding agencies, um, which are NSERC, SHRC, and CIHR. Um, so all three agencies offer awards at the doctoral and the master's level as well. Um, so doctoral students can apply for, they have two different competitions. There's one called the Vanier Canada Graduate Scholarships. That one is $50,000 a year for three years. Um, the deadline for that has passed for this year, so the next competition will actually be next summer in 2021. Um, there's also sort of, I, I kind of call them just the, the regular sort of tri-agency doctoral awards, so SHRC, NSERC, and CIHR offer these awards. Um, they offer sort of two tiers of awards, one they call the CGSD, that one is $35,000 for three years, and then they each agency also offers a doctoral award, which are around $20,000 per year. SHRC is $20,000 and CERC is $21,000. And the duration of those varies depending how long the stu far the student is in their program if they are um, offered an award. So the third one are the Canada Graduate Scholarships Masters. So again, these are offered by the tri-agencies. Each agency offers awards. They're $17,500 for one year only. Um, this competition is running now, so if there's any master students who are applying for this or interested to apply, you still have time. The deadline is not until December 1st annually, so you have until December 1st, 2020 to apply for that opportunity. If you will be in year one or year two of your master's starting next September, okay? Um, a few other awards I'll go over. There's also uh, some external provincial level awards through Research Manitoba. They offer both master's and PhD studentships. The master's are valued at $12,000 a year, the PhD at $17,850 for one year. As well, the Faculty of Graduate Studies, we offer a major fellowship called the University of Manitoba Graduate Fellowship, um, <clears throat> both at the master's and PhD level. Um, students who are interested in applying for the UMGF would actually want to consult with their home department to find out the deadline and application procedure. As well, um, there are departmental scholarships. As I mentioned, sort of in my example earlier, each department and program has some awards that are specifically for students studying that area. In my example, I gave biological sciences, but this goes for pretty much almost every department at the university. Um, like. As example, plant science has some, nursing has some, anthropology has some. So each department has a small amount of awards that they have that they can give just to students studying in their area. So this is a very, 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 very brief overview of graduate awards. Um, these are some of the major funding competitions. We also have other competitions that we run through our office. Um, and they're listed on our website and also in that email I mentioned we, we send out each week. Um, so that was really my, my Coles Notes version of, of graduate funding. Um, but absolutely, if there are any questions from anyone in the audience, please feel free. I, I'm happy to answer any questions of anything I didn't cover or questions on things in the presentation. And I'm, I'm happy to answer if you'd like to put your question into the chat.
Okay, sir, I got one question here. Um, someone's asking, I'm wondering if you could speak to the differences in award opportunities for part-time versus full-time students. Oh, very good question. So um, the majority, the majority, and again, I don't have, have static numbers in my mind, but I would say a good 95% of awards are for full-time graduate students. However, um, full-time versus part-time in graduate studies works a little bit differently than undergrad. So, um, for example, in graduate studies, full-time or part-time is simply a status. It does not relate to the, the number of credit hours you register for. Okay? All students are admitted to graduate studies as full-time students, and if they want to be part-time, they have to request to be part-time. And there's just a form they fill out, and usually if their department signs off on it, they can be part-time. However, most awards, it depends on the terms of the award. And the terms of the award are set either by, for example, the external funding agency, such as SHRC, NSERC, or CHR, or we also have donors that donate to the university, um, and their wishes are written into the criteria to reflect their wishes for their donation to the award and many of those donors will opt to only give it to full-time students. But depending on the program and the awards available, for example, some programs have a number of awards for part-time students because they have indicated to donors that they have a lot of part-time students. Uh, my best example in my mind is a program, um, the Master of Social Work program. They have quite a number of awards that can go to full-time or part-time students, and as well, some in nursing as well. Um, so I'm hoping that that helps. Um, well, if you wanted to contact Sarah after, uh, all of our presenter contact information will be um, on our website, uh, so you can uh, follow up with her after. Um, but thanks so much uh, for sharing that with us, Sarah. That's great. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'll just stop sharing my screen here. There we go. Well, thanks, everyone, for attending. And like Justin said, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or our Graduate Awards email. Perfect. Did you want me to change the presenter back to you, Justin? Sorry. Um, I can take care of that. Thank you. I think. I okay, should... cool. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay, so next we have Louis Gervais. Louis is the Academic Integrity Coordinator at the U of M, and she works within student engagement and success, which includes units such as student life, community engaged learning, career services, and the Academic Learning Center. As Academic Integrity Coordinator, Louis develops educational programming, training, and initiatives to promote a culture of integrity on campus and support students in developing skills and understanding of academic expectations in order to be successful in their studies. Louis holds a BA Honors in Psychology and an MSc in Organizational Behavior from the Asker School of Business. And I will pass it off to Louis here. Thanks, Justin. Um, can everybody see me okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. I'm just going to set my timer, make sure I don't go over time. Um, so, hello, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here with you today, even though it's, it's not in person. Um, I'm going to be talking about academic integrity. I know that all of you as graduate students already have a fair um, basis of knowledge around academic integrity. Um, but a lot of issues that come up are not so black and white, especially at the graduate level. Um, so I work with many different units and departments across campus. Um, and I have been in my position for about five years as well as being uh, a graduate student at the U of M. So uh, I'm quite familiar with a lot of the issues that students do face. Um, so I, I hope that this will give you some, some useful information. But again, feel free to use the chat function for any other questions. So um, before I, I talk about kind of um, the behaviors or the, the pitfalls that students can sometimes fall into at the graduate level or at any level really, um, I would like to start off by mentioning how academic integrity isn't the behaviors we should be avoiding, it's actually what we should be demonstrating in our work. 
So uh, the university uses the definition of academic integrity from the International Center of Academic Integrity, and it defines academic integrity as a commitment to honesty, trust, fairness, respect, responsibility, and courage. And I always encourage graduate students to come back to these values consistently as you're doing your work, because you're going to have issues that come up um, where it's not always clear how you should move forward, what the right thing is to do. Um, and certainly, I can help as a, as a resource person to answer some of those questions, as well as many of my colleagues on campus. Um, but ultimately, it comes down to how are we demonstrating these values that are going to not only uh, reflect well on the university and the knowledge that comes out of the university, but also for us personally, our professional um, and academic reputation. So um, it can be really easy to get kind of bogged down by uh, all these kind of technicalities around things like citing and referencing when really we're talking about much larger implications. So I'm sure that you are at least somewhat familiar with the forms of academic misconduct at the university. Um, the fact that graduate studies requires graduate students to complete a uh, mandatory course on academic integrity. So we have um, these six forms of academic misconduct that are defined by the Student Discipline Bylaw and Academic Misconduct Procedures. So these are documents that really give us guidance and information on what is considered to violate academic integrity standards at the university. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail into each of these because um, I know that <laughs> we were limited in our time and you also already have some of that understanding. But there's two that I wanted to highlight in particular because they often um, give rise to questions for graduate students. Um, due to the nature of your work. So the first one that comes up a lot is inappropriate collaboration. So students are thinking, well, it's different at the graduate level than the undergraduate level. Like, I might be co-authoring papers. I may be a part of a research team. I'm working with an advisor. Um, oftentimes, a, a paper is collaborative, especially if you're going to be publishing it. Um, so some of those questions around inappropriate collaboration and what are the differences between, you know, an academic setting at the U of M um, and then what is what is the norm in uh, the publishing world or, the, or outside of the university? Those kinds of questions can come up. Um, another big one that comes up for graduate students is the idea of duplicate submission. So if you're familiar with this definition, this is basically when you submit an assignment, either in whole or in part, for a grade more than once. So as a grad student, you're becoming very highly specialized in a particular area, and you're going to be writing about the, the same thing a lot. Um, so oftentimes, concerns will come up for graduate students related to duplicate submission as well. So those are the two that I'll sort of highlight here, but I do encourage you to, um, if you haven't already complete the um, Grad 7500 course, and um, make sure you're really familiar with, with all of these types of behaviors. So one of the questions that uh, often comes up, you know, as grad students, you've invested a lot to get to this point. Um, so people want to know what would happen if you faced an allegation of academic misconduct and it was upheld. Um, so the first thing that you should know as a grad student is that all cases that concern a grad student are referred to FTS. So they're not actually dealt with at the departmental level. They go straight to an associate dean at the faculty of graduate studies. So that kind of gives you uh, a sense of, of how seriously academic misconduct is taken, especially at the graduate level. Um, the, the penalties can really depend on a variety of factors. So they could be anything from uh, zero on a test or an assignment to uh, a failing mark in a course. Um, you can also have a disciplinary notation on your transcript, sometimes for a year, sometimes two years or more, depending on the severity of the academic misconduct. Um, and also, depending on the severity, you could face actually suspension and expulsion. So all of these things, as you can imagine, can really impact um, your uh, trajectory as a grad student, your aspirations um, within your field. So in a very practical level, if you're an international student, this can impact your study permit. Um, as any student, it can delay your graduation, especially if you're required to retake a class. But not to mention, it just 
causes a lot of stress. Um, and so anything that I can do to provide clarification or to refer you to the right person so that you can avoid a situation of academic misconduct is great. So um, I just wanted to kind of touch on a few of the concerns that tend to come up at the graduate level. Just going to check my time here. Um, a few seconds left. So in case you, you don't have any questions for me, um, I'm just going to touch on some of the ones that, that tend to come up. So we've got time management. Um, in a lot of the, the graduate student cases that, that I see, time management is a huge one. Um, reference management and organization, which is something that librarians can really help with. Um, as I already mentioned, self-plagiarism or duplicate submission. Um, properly integrating source material, especially secondary sources and the parameters around that. I also mentioned co-authorship or working with, within a team. Understanding expectations, both at the university level, as well as the expectations of your advisor, of your professors, of your field as a whole. Um, and then lastly, often graduate students feel um, hesitant to seek support because they feel like they should know the answer to all of these questions that might come up. But as I mentioned, academic integrity can be a, 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 a bit of a gray area. Um, so I always encourage grad students to, to seek that support to, for clarification. So that's a really quick rundown. We'll open it up now for any questions, if there are any. Um, if there aren't any questions, I do have one question that I often get in person at the grad student open house that I can, that I can talk about a little bit, if that's okay. For sure, that'd be great. Yeah, so a lot of times students want to know, okay, uh, I'm really scared of accidentally plagiarizing. Is there a software that I can use um, to catch plagiarism? So um, there is a software called Authenticate um, that can be used as a tool to kind of flag inconsistencies in your writing. Um, it can only be used um, by researchers and grad students, and it can only be used on your own writing. So what it would do is it would kind of go through your, your paper and see if there's any inconsistencies in terms of citing, if you have a particular passage that really closely matches um, you know, something online, which indicates you might not have paraphrased properly or you should have quoted. Um, so a lot of students want to know, can I just use a program like that to you know, check mark that I, that I didn't plagiarize? And I always say that um, things like paraphrasing, quoting, citing, and referencing, it's really a skill that you have to develop. So a program like that can be helpful, but it's really only intended as a tool. It will not necessarily catch plagiarism, and it might um, catch something that is not plagiarism and, and cause a lot of confusion as well. There's no kind of threshold percentage or level that is acceptable at the university in terms of um, plagiarism per se. Great. Thanks so much, Louis. So as a reminder, you can um, contact Loie as well. Uh, her email is there. If you have any uh, questions for, uh, that you'd want to ask Loie, she could follow up with you. Absolutely. Thanks. OK, so next we have David Ness. And David Ness is the director of the Student Counseling Center on campus and was also a graduate student on our campus in the clinical psycholo psychological program. He has worked on campus since 1991. So David will be talking today about managing stress during these challenging times, and will also tell you about the services available to you through the Student Counseling Center. So I will just uh, pass it off to David here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to go right into talking a little bit about uh, stress, and I uh, don't have much time, so I'll just do a little bit of a presentation. I'll talk about our services as well, and then see what questions uh, everybody has. So I thought a good way to start off would be to just uh, uh, talk about uh, you know, this unique time that we have right now. Now this is a very challenging, overwhelming time for many of us. And it's very unique in that everybody's being impacted by one uh, common foe, if you will, in COVID-19. In fact, I heard uh, just uh, uh, an hour ago that uh, Winnipeg's moving into a lockdown again as of Thursday. Uh, in terms of businesses as well. So we're back to where we were in the spring in terms of uh, the impact on our, on our uh, world. So, you know, managing stress, dealing with things during challenging times, uh, you know, that's, that's something we all have to do. And certainly as grad students, uh, you're probably familiar with stress. 
because you have a lot of demands on you, educational demands, as represented by my yellow circle here. What I'm kind of showing on this slide is this idea that you know, there's lots of stress is happening in people's worlds all the time. They come from a variety of different uh, places in people's lives, like your educational programs, uh, like money uh, issues, relationships. Uh, survival tasks, what I mean by that is the things you do day to day just to take care of yourself, doing laundry, getting groceries, paying bills. That all can cause stress as well. It's responsibility. It takes time. Uh, so all these things are going on in our world, and at any one time, we can feel stress from them. Um, and, you know, most of us can handle some stress in one or two areas, uh, as long as it's moderate to minor. But as it starts to accumulate and get bigger and bigger, it can be overwhelming. And that's what COVID has done, because COVID is kind of like a big stressor, as represented by the circle. And it's impacting all these other areas, too. It's impacted your learning experiences as graduate students. It's impacted your relationships, how you connect with others. We know it's impacted people's money. People have lost jobs, other opportunities, maybe family members, people you care about, about are in more financial difficulty due to COVID. It's impacted just the survival tax, how we operate day in, day out. And all of this then requires more energy from us and can create a lot of stress for us. So one thing I want to talk about in my limited time was something that I don't know that uh, everybody here has thought about, and that's grief. But I'm going to get to that in a moment. There's a phrase I'd like everybody here, including the presenters, to keep in mind if you're feeling stressed dealing with COVID and everything else that's going on in the world right now. And that is what's at the top of this slide, uh, that being that you're a normal person with normal reactions during this abnormal time. So it makes sense that many of us are feeling a lot of stress because this is so unusual. You probably have a lot of fear and anxiety responses, worries for self and others. You might be depressed, bored, because you can't engage in the world in a way that you used to. You might have anger, frustration, irritability because of, of what's being foisted upon you because you don't have the same agency or control over your life. And that can be really difficult to accept. And again, we can have grief. And I want to talk about grief specifically because I think this is something that's not being talked about as often during the pandemic in situations not related to people becoming seriously ill or dying. Of course, we recognize that there's grief in those situations, but there's also grief from other losses that many people have experienced. You know, most of us, for example, have had to change the way we go about our daily lives. Uh, sometimes these changes have resulted in good things, but sometimes the things that we've missed and lost as well. We've had a lot of potential losses, uh, losses in routines, things we do day in, day out, rituals. And by rituals, I mean those, those things we really look forward to as a pattern or something that we do with others or with ourselves. These losses have happened in areas like the economy, social. We've, we've got fewer in-person connections. We might, might be more isolated. It might be a physical loss. We're less physically active. We can't do the things we used to, like being part of a sports team. Or I hear gyms are all closing now, so you can't go to the gym to work out. So that's a loss. Uh, emotional. We've heard from some students they don't have the same confidence in themselves or their future because of the pandemic. Again, that's a loss. Academic, we hear people feeling less secure about when they were graduate, or just how their programs will evolve as well. Again, another loss. And what I've been finding is uh, some of these losses aren't really acknowledged as losses by others, and we may not even have a way to talk about them. I mean, we know when someone passes away, we have rituals and ways to talk about that. But these kind of losses are a little bit tougher, and sometimes we don't recognize them as losses, so then we don't do anything about it. So I wanted to encourage all of you to think about, are there losses that you've experienced, things you're really missing that's happened since the pandemic started? And, and maybe do a little bit of a compassionate statement to yourself saying that, you know, this is probably grief that I'm going through. I wanted to share with you in my last couple minutes a way to manage grief. There's a lot of different processes, a lot of different recommendations. I like this one from Tara Bratch, and she uses the acronym RAIN. R stands for recognize what is going on. I'll talk about these in a bit more detail in a moment. A stands for allow the experience to be there, just as it is. I stands for, <clears throat> excuse me, investigate with interest and care. And N is nurture with self-compassion. So what does this look like? Well, uh, recognize what is going on. Consciously acknowledge and say to yourself, you know, I might be stuck. I'm feeling pain. I'm a normal person. This is a normal reaction. It's this time that is really unusual. And lots of people are having this pain right now. You might use what I like to call a simple mental whisper, acknowledging what has come up, like I'm feeling really exhausted and worn out right now. It's important to acknowledge what you're experiencing or you're not going to do anything to take care of yourself. 
uh, allow the experience to be there just as it is. Let's not run from our emotions, run from our feelings. A lot of times we do that, we suppress them, we push them away. Oh, I've got a minute left. Um, and, and that doesn't work because those emotions don't just disappear, they tend to build and build. So you might have to just let it be within you sometimes. Even use that mental whisper of the phrase, well, I'm just gonna let this be for a while. You know, you might feel worry, guilt, apprehension. You might say to yourself, it's okay to feel this. People have painful feelings and I'm no different than others. You can't avoid it. Investigate with interest and care. Maybe deepen your attention. Maybe explore, what are these feelings about? What am I really missing? Uh, maybe check into your body. What's my body feeling right now? Uh, do I feel tension in my muscles? Um, do I have a headache? Is my breathing really rapid? And as you're doing this checking, be kind of curious about how you're reacting and try to suspend judgment. Let's not be critical of ourselves. Just as you would support other people, maybe try to put that supportive uh, approach towards yourself. I find often people can support others way better than they can support themselves. That's why the last part here is nurture with self-compassion. You know, let's, if we do these other stages, naturally we can be more kind to ourselves. Let's sense what you're, you're experiencing and hurting. And maybe remind yourself you might need a message of reassurance, of forgiveness, of companionship, some kind of message that's saying, you know, I, I'm going to stay with this. I'm with myself. It's not my fault. I can survive this. Everyone feels grief at times. Maybe even when you do this, play, gently place a, a hand on your heart or on your cheek just in a nurturing way. That can actually feel powerful. So just in closing, recognize the grief. Try to do some things around it. Don't stay silent with it. Uh, a little bit about us, and I'll stop, Justin. Uh, we're still operating. You know, we uh, are operating remotely, of course. Um, you might tell I'm in my office. I, I have access to my office, which I appreciate, uh, where you have individual counseling. We have groups. We have workshops. We do outreach as well. So we're still operating in that way. If you'd like to access our services or learn more about them, go to our website. <clears throat> our, our services are free to students, and they are confidential. We're not going to tell anyone that you're coming to see us. There's our contact number there, 4748592. And you can phone if you want individual counseling. You do have to attend an initial intake appointment first, and you can request that at that number. Or look at our workshops and groups. They're really helpful. Uh, we have a whole uh, really rich menu of programs that students can benefit from. You could do something tomorrow, or not tomorrow, it's a day off, but on Thursday or Friday, you could get some help right away. So take a look at those programs as well. And that's where I'll stop, Justin. Fantastic, David. Thank you. Um, just looking in the chat, nothing has come up yet. Uh, I'll just give it a moment or two. Okay. Just as we're waiting, uh, Justin, because I, I, I can't sit silent. I'll just add a couple more things for people. You know, one of the things I'll also say about managing stress um, is if you're feeling stressed, really consider talking to someone that you trust. Don't keep it silent within you. That typically doesn't help us. Um, you know, you, you pick who you trust, though. It might be a family member, it might be a partner, it might be a friend, it might be a fellow graduate student, your advisor, it could be us, it could be your pastor, it doesn't matter who. If you're struggling, whether it's with grief, other types of stress, uh, do something to take care of yourself. You'll feel better for it. That's great. Thanks for all the great information. Um... There hasn't been anything coming in, but uh, okay. you have your contact information there, your website that's really helpful. Thank you for that. Welcome. Okay, so if there's nothing nothing okay, coming I'll, in here. Um, I'll stop thanks. the screen share. That's great. Yeah, thanks, David. Okay, yeah. and uh, let's move over to Meg Miller now. So Meg Miller is the GIS and Data Visualization Librarian at the University of Manitoba Libraries. Meg helps graduate students communicate their research through mapping and other data visualization methods. When she's not working from home, she can be found in the Elizabeth Dafo Library in the Hallway of Silence, which is the on the third floor of the of the library. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. Can everybody see my screen? Yep, it all looks good. Sweet. Okay. So, as Justin mentioned, my name is Meg, and I'm the GIS and Data Viz Librarian at University of Manitoba. I'm part of the Research Services and Digital Strategies Unit team. I'm an ex-cartographer um, who happens to like talking to people, so I made the switch to academia 
Usually I'm in Elizabeth Defoe, but now you can book appointments with me online. And the whole reason that I'm here is to help you not blind people with, sci with science. So what can I help you with? Formally, finding spatial data for research or secondary data sets to support your analysis, communicating research through mapping and other visualization methods. And, but what does that actually mean? So for me, it's when a student comes to talk to me and says, hey, I've collected some data on study areas and I'm looking at finding some roads data or the crop inventory or something like, or rivers or something like that to put in behind it. So it's finding supporting data that's available with to support their research. It's dealing with researchers who may have accidentally renamed 3,000 files and they're trying to figure out how they can automate naming those instead of having to go back through and do them all by hand. It's looking at GIS analysis. So say a researcher has gone through, they've collected a bunch of data for the city of Winnipeg, and for some reason half of it's showing up in Russia. So it's figuring out, oh, what's going on there? How can we fix that? It is looking for different packages in R to do specific tasks. So say somebody was looking to map food deserts within a city. Um, are there R packages already available that can be easily modified that will help you do that? It's talking about appropriate symbology to use in your visualizations. So color, line weight, font, all of that th type of thing so that you don't mislead your user. It's going through legal counsel when if there is a data set that you're looking at gaining access to that the library doesn't currently have access to, I can help facilitate that process. And it's also helping you find learning materials so that if you are new to a software like, say, ArcGIS, figuring out, okay, what are some high quality resources that can help me through that task? There are two main ways that I help students with this. I guess three if you count our, my data viz lib guide. So data visualization guide is on the main page of the library website and under the data tab. And it's a way to contact me and figure out how to get started if you are trying to visualize your data. So under the getting started tab, what I like to do is break things down into four major categories. So step back, you've got your research data, and think, okay, what am I trying to show? Is it a comparison? Is it composition? Is it distribution? Or is it a relationship? And then looking at main types of visualizations that you can use for each of those. So for comparison, things like column graphs, cartographic maps, in terms of composition, pie charts, stack bar charts, tree maps, Distribution is things like line graphs, histograms, scatter plots, cartographic maps. Or if you're looking at showing relationships, things like scatter plots, network diagrams, bubble graphs, concept models, or cartographic maps. Then how can you go about doing that? Many different tools. So we also have some, I also linked to some accessibility tools. So if you want to see what your visualization is going to look like to somebody who has color blindness, or if you are trying to figure out an appropriate color palette to use, if you're creating graphics in both grayscale and full color, uh, those are two tools you can use there, Cobliss and the Color Brewer. Under visualization, if you're looking at making charts, graphs, and simple maps, there's a couple of tools like Excel, Gephi, Power BI, Tableau, for infographics, things like PictoCharts or Vizme. For maps, GIS is the Esri package, so ArcGIS Pro, ArcGIS Online, and then QGIS is the open source alternative for that. If you would rather code, 
You can use something like Leaflitter Mapbox to make simple web maps. Use Python, use R. There's some popular palettes that you can use to symbolize your data with. Um, things like Timeline.js, you can create interactive timelines. And then if we go back up, back to the help, is just back to my contact information. The easiest way to get a hold of me is to book a consultation from this tab here. Um, that way it slots you right in and you can upload any data sets or give me any pointers that you think would be useful to me. So for booking those consultations, think of me as a tool specialist. Uh, I support, so far, there are 25 different programs and faculties across campus who have come ask for asking for questions. And I'm not a specialist in all those areas, but what I am is a specialist in using the software. So it's up to you and your advisor to figure out the appropriate analysis and, that you're going to use and your design and your methodology. And then if you're having issues with the actual visual, visualizing of your data, um, contact me in terms of anything from Python, R, QGIS, ArcGIS, Story Maps, all of that stuff. I also have some sessions coming up in the fall and winter term. Usually they are on Wednesdays between 12 and 3. All of these links in the PowerPoint um, go right to the registration page, so I've provided the links to the PowerPoint at the end, and you can enroll if you want. So up and coming is accessing geospatial data for City of Winnipeg in the province of Manitoba. Some of that is open data, others are very closed and locked down, and that's where we talk about going through the legal counsel process. December 2nd, it's a walk through open data and the Manitoba crop inventory. Into the winter term, it's a lot more focused on tools, so an introduction to QGIS, Power BI, infographics, ArcGIS spatial analytics, data visualization, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It talks a lot more about data visualization theory and use of color. Um, and then finally, April 7th is network analysis and visualization using Gephi. So lots of different ways to visualize, and it all comes down to you having good, clean data, you understanding your data, and with that, figuring out what the appropriate tool and the appropriate um, technique is to do your visualization. So my contact information is meg.miller at umanitoba.ca. If you want to get access to my slides, there's the bit.ly link for them. And that's it for me. Does anybody have any questions? That's fantastic, Meg. Thank you. Um, we have a, well, it's a comment, actually. Uh, uh, someone says, this is absolutely amazing. I did not know that these tools were available. I will absolutely check this out and relay this to the other graduate students that I know. Awesome. That's a good comment there. Everyone has Meg's email there. Uh, you can download the slides if you'd like. Uh, check out any of the tools she was mentioning. Um, that's great. Thanks so much, Meg. No problem. Thanks for having me. So since 2012, Dr. Darren Fast has been the Director of Partnerships and Innovation at the U of M. He has over 20 years of experience assessing and moving research-based technologies into the private sector, as well as facilitating collaborative research partnerships with industry. He'll be speaking to you today about how partnerships and innovation can be of help to you as a graduate student. So with that, I'll pass it off to Dr. Fast. Okay. Um, well, I see that I, I can't quite share my slides, but I will uh, share them later. It's it's a pretty simple presentation. There's uh, just basically uh, notes for me to, to talk about. But um, the Partnership and Innovation Office is really about four different things. Um, one of them is capturing value of research, and this is really about the taking the research and trying to move it into the community into new products and services so we do that through uh, intellectual property uh, things like patenting and licensing those technologies perhaps uh, starting some new companies with those technologies as well 
We're also tasked with uh, increasing the economic impact of the University of Manitoba. And this is really about um, collaborative partnerships with industry. So again, uh, talking all about knowledge transfer from the university to industry and also in the other direction. Um, there's a lot of challenges that industry has uh, that make really good projects for graduate students. So there's, uh, there's opportunity there for knowledge transfer to go both ways. Um, researchers benefit by understanding what some of the challenges that, um, that industry is facing are. Um, we also manage the MyTax program um, for the university. And that is a, a great funding source if you are uh, doing a collaborative partnership with industry. Um, and that's a way for industry to, to, to really reduce the cost for them uh, around that. Uh, the third thing that we do is we're focused on uh, helping to develop entrepreneurs. Uh, we run a couple of uh, competitions uh, annually. We'll see how this all floats out with the whole COVID thing. Uh, but we've been involved in things like Game Changer and Ramp Up Manitoba in conjunction with groups like North Forge and the Stu Clark Center for Entrepreneurship. So there's a lot of ways for um, students to uh, to think about, you know, what happens post-graduation. Once you're done your master's or PhD program, uh, what do you do? Um, and it may be that you want to go work uh, and start your own business. So we can uh, we can help facilitate that. Uh, and then we do stuff like this, which is around education and making sure that there are common expectations. And we do this with uh, industry members as well, because there's a there's a pretty big gap sometimes between what the academic world sees and what the uh, what the industry sees. Um, just a note around our intellectual property policy as a university. Um, you probably don't recall when you signed on to be a student at the university that said you'd abide by all uh, policies of the university. One of those policies is our intellectual property policy. Um, and we have a, what's considered a jointly owned intellectual property policy. So if any invention that's created as you are a student or staff or anybody else that works for the university, 50% is owned by the inventors, 50% is owned by the institution. Um, that, again, applies to everybody, and there is an obligation to disclose any inventions you do create. So if you do think you've invented something, uh, please talk to my office. Um, the exception here is copyright, and that does belong to the creators of that. So when you write a paper, uh, that is truly uh, yours as the, as the creator of that. But uh, everything else is jointly owned with the institution. Uh, we do have an invention disclosure form, which is uh, helpful. It's a, just a couple of pages. It's really easy to fill out. Uh, it's filled out by the inventor. That gives us enough information to start doing some due diligence around that, to ask the question of, is this something that has commercial value, or, or is it something that's best just put out there as a publication? Uh, we like to see them early, uh, definitely before the papers are published. Uh, and that's a really important point I'll talk about in just a little bit. Uh, we can typically turn stuff around in, in two to three weeks. So if you've got something that you think is an invention, talk to us. We'll, uh, you know, and, and a really good time is once you have a draft publication. So you may not have all the figures or anything else, but that's a good time for us to take a look at it um, and assess whether it does have commercial potential. And in the slide presentation, which I'll share, um, uh, there, there will be a, a link to that. Um, just a little bit about intellectual property itself. Um, there are effectively four types. There's copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets, and patents. Um, the only one that I'm going to spend any time on at all um, and, and of course, you're all welcome to, to come and ask me uh, for more detail. I've got a, um, a full presentation on, on intellectual property um, is, is patents. So patents, uh, three criteria for patents that are really, really important. They have to be new, which is not that hard of a, a barrier, but um, it has to be non-obvious. 
which is a diff more difficult concept to understand. Um, and that's not obvious to somebody who's an expert in the field. So your peers shouldn't necessarily have thought, well, of course that would happen. It can't be predictable. Um, and it has to be useful. And if you're the one paying for patents, um, which can really get quite expensive, um, they do, uh, you, you would require them to be useful. Um, they, patents are country specific. So you, you, don't just have all the rights you want just because you filed something in a country. Um, and the really important thing is you can miss the opportunity to have a patent if there is a public disclosure before you file a patent application. So that means that if a paper is published, that's a public disclosure. If you present the stuff at a conference, that might be considered a public disclosure depending on, on exactly what you talk about. Um, but so it's really important um, to make sure that you file patents before there is a public disclosure. Um, <coughs> at the end of the day, uh, it's important to remember though, the patenting isn't about the technology itself. It's about creating a business opportunity. And, and that's one of those things that's, uh, that's really important to, to recognize. Um, I'm just going to talk for a couple of moments here about uh, partnerships as well. Um, we do a lot of work with companies, um, and we do have a program right now called the Manitoba Industry Academia Partnership Program, um, which is across all post-secondaries, but it is run out of the, the U of M. Um, and that the aim of that is really to increase the number of partnerships with the private sector. And so there, there is a ton of opportunities for, for graduate students. Um, there's programs like NSERC Alliance and the, the MyTax suite of programs, which really help facilitate some of that. Um, but you can think of your standard Venn diagram where you've got industry on one side, academia on the other, and a little bit of overlap between the two. And that overlap is really where we're trying to focus and grow. Um, Manitoba and Canada um, is we, we underperform in that overlap area so there's a huge opportunity to increase that and to see the results of research uh, translated into uh, goods and services that can be sold uh, ideally globally that can benefit um, our economy and because much of the research is paid for through taxes which are uh, in large part paid for by uh, corporations and people who are working in those corporations, uh, there is an opportunity to increase the, the amount of research that happens and to make our, our university stronger as a result of that. A um, couple of things with, with partnering with industry. Um, it's important to remember, uh, you know, who's, who's driving it? Why are you doing it? That's an important question. Is it industry driven? Is it researcher driven? Um, you know, it is relationship-based. Uh, I think that's a really important thing to remember is your collabor it's like any other collaboration. Um, you need to make sure you've got a good relationship with uh, your partner. Um, intellectual property becomes really important here, and we've got a strategy to manage that. So if you're talking to industry, industry wants to collaborate, again, come talk to our office. We will help you uh, manage the IP side of things, and the Office of Research Services does the contracts that are, are uh, important for there. Um, we always retain the right to publish. So as a university, we will not do secret research uh, for companies, but uh, you know we do have unique skills, capabilities, equipment that industry doesn't have. So there is a there is an opportunity there to uh, to create some sort of a win-win, and that's really what we aim for in all of our collaborations. Um, I will stop there, and um, if there's any questions, happy to answer them. Thanks so, so much for sharing. That was really good. Uh, I had no idea about the, the IP policy on campus, actually. Uh, that was really interesting. No problem. Um, let me transfer this presenter mode back to you, Justin. For sure. Yeah, here. Uh, 
Okay, so next up is Marie Spear. So Marie Spear is the science librarian for microbiology, chemistry, and engineering, and she works uh, in the sciences and technology libraries. She is an expert in citing, referencing, and she will be speaking to you today about citation management software, which, if you don't know already, is very helpful to organize your references. So I will pass it off to Marie here. As Justin mentioned, I'm um, a liaison librarian in the Sciences and Technology Library and also a liaison in engineering. And I'm going to be talking to you about citing support in the, from the University of Manitoba Libraries. As Justin mentioned, I'll be talking about a little bit about reference management software, but we also can help with uh, discipline specific support for different citation styles. Uh, science has a lot of different citation styles, and sometimes you may have to use more than one style depending upon uh, what you're doing. And if you have any questions relating to how a particular style works, uh, we're happy to help you out. So they, we have a variety of different uh, liaison librarians that support uh, graduate students in the different uh, faculties. And I would recommend that you meet with the liaison librarian for your subject area and they can recommend a particular reference manager that works well for your discipline. Uh, some things that we might take into account are what styles you tend to use and um, as well as uh, your particular needs like the type of information that you're trying to keep track of. The uh, liaison librarians uh, are listed on a, the subject guide for your department and so here we have uh, uh, the library's website a screenshot and you can see there's the subject guides option and you can click on the subject guides and find your department or faculty. Here we have the page for uh, the Faculty of Environment, Earth and Resources and on the guide is uh, a picture and contact information for the liaison librarian for that area who is Grace Rowland and there's also options to connect with them by email, uh, chat or scheduling an appointment. So we really recommend that you look into using a reference manager to keep track of uh, the references and different documents that you need for your uh, graduate studies. As uh, Loi mentioned, it, it can be useful to because you're keep trying to keep track of a lot of different documents and the uh, reference management software allows you to organize and annotate the PDF documents so you can add notes into the reference manager about particular uh, information that you need to keep track of. There's ways to organize it by uh, folders in some cases or add tags to help you uh, retrieve the papers again. There's search features within the reference manager that let you be able to refine the document. And as you have more and more documents that you're keeping track of, this gets a little more difficult to keep track of. So that's why a reference manager is, is useful. A lot of the reference managers nowadays will allow you to import uh, PDF documents and then they will uh, try to retrieve the citation details automatically. Uh, it doesn't, it's not, they're not perfect. You often will have to make some changes to the details. Um, some of the older documents, like if you, I don't know, say before 2000, might not be able to, uh, they might not even be able to retrieve any details. Um, but it's easier than um, doing everything by yourself, so it, um, you can usually get a good portion of the information uh, automatically extracted. You can also use reference managers to organize and download citations from databases for systematic reviews. If anyone is doing a systematic review, usually you have to look at, you know, 
thousand records or more from different databases. And this uh, is actually fairly essential to use a, a reference manager for that, this purpose. You can also automatically create in-text citations and reference lists in a large variety of styles. And you can change the style with a click of a button so that if you are writing and submitting a paper to a journal and it um, doesn't get accepted and you want to resit submit to another journal that requires a different style, it's a very easy process to change your, your styles. Some of the reference management software also allow you to create BibTeX files if you are a LaTeX user. So even if you don't need it uh, to write and cite in, in something like Microsoft Word, you can still use the reference manager to help manage your files. And you can also share citation lists with groups and or advisors. So at the University of Manitoba libraries, we primarily support three reference management systems. There are others, uh, but these are probably the more popular ones, but there are some other reference managers out there. Uh, so we support uh, Mendeley, which allows you to store up to two gigabytes of documents online uh, for free. There's also EndNote, which you have to purchase, and it's about, uh, I think, around $150 for a student um, educational program through the bookstore. So that's uh, a little bit of a pricier one. And then there's Zotero, which is an open source program. Uh, it has limited free storage, but you can purchase extra storage for a small cost, something like $20 for two gigabytes for a year. We have comparison tables available on a citation management subject guide. And if you go to that subject guide page uh, that I mentioned for the liaison librarians, then you have to find the uh, subject for your like your department you could just type in um, citation management and you should be able to get to this guide so on the guide we have comparison tables that highlight some of the key differences between the citation managers as well as some getting started information and contacts uh, that you librarians that you can contact for more information well, before I go to questions, I just wanted to also mention that we are offering some sessions through the Grad Steps program on reference managers. I have a Mendeley session coming up next Thursday, I believe. And there was just an EndNote session, and the, you can find uh, the EndNote basic session through the library's YouTube channel. Uh, they recorded the session, so that's available. I didn't see anything coming up for Zotero. Although I find that Zotero is actually more useful for social sciences and humanities areas than for science because it doesn't support uh, the same um, number of journal abbreviations like EndNote and, and Mendeley. So if you want to get started, uh, you can, you know, try out uh, one of the reference managers on your own. You can make an appointment with one of the librarians. You can attend one of the uh, sessions that we have. And there's, um, they're not particularly difficult to use, but sometimes people do need a little bit of guidance just to make sure that the things are working correctly. And that's what you can contact us, us for. So I, uh, I uh, guess we'll stop there and I'll uh, see if there are any questions. Great. Thanks, Mary. Um, I'm not seeing anything that has come in right now. Just give it a few moments. Just while we're waiting, I threw in the chat the website for the grad open house so you can find the uh, presenter contact, contact information there if you had any follow-up questions. 
Okay, so I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, anyone can contact Marie afterwards. Her contact information is on that uh, grad, Science Grad Open House website. Uh, so thanks so much, Marie, for, for presenting today. Okay, I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, so I just wanted to uh, send a thank you out to the rest of the planning committee for today's event. Uh, their names are listed there. And thank you to all the presenters for um, graciously giving you, uh, uh, giving up some of your time, uh, showing some great, great information, great supports that our graduate students can, uh, can uh, get from you or from your office, from your teams. Um, so thanks everyone for attending. Um, I have a, um, I'll just copy the uh, URL here. Um, so just a short survey if anyone wanted to give feedback uh, just for um, future events. Uh, you can give your comments. Um, and then, of course, if you have any additional questions, you can always follow up with our presenters. And all of their contact information is available at that uh, link that I posted uh, just a few minutes ago. So thanks so much, everyone. Thanks so much for attending, and thanks so much for presenting.